Here's one for you. The first thing I did on my Gen 1 and the first thing I did on my Gen 2, because everybody does it, is uh, I took the airbox off and I got the Rottweiler and it's like, you know, the airbox is away and now there's just this big empty area and maybe you can hear it accelerating, it sounds a little throaty, that's all wonderful. But there's actually some wicked science that goes on. If you ever notice when you take the gas tank off to take the air box out and throw it in the trash, when you took your air box, um, your gas tank off, you notice there's padding underneath? What do you think that padding's for? Like, the shock absorption? No. <laughs> that padding is actually there to cut down on like the sonic resonance that happens underneath the tank, in that airspace, because apparently, as it's been explained to me, you want air above the intakes to be as calm, as neutral as possible, like a, like a very peaceful atmosphere. And I had the Rottweiler open air box system, and I didn't feel like the bike was very fast. Of course, down low, super fast and sounds good and all this stuff. But I found that the Gen 1 and the Gen 2 and the Gen 3 die above like 110 miles an hour. They just, they just die. They just, that great acceleration that you get down low and middle, like it's just an animal. It's the beast, right? Above 110, 120 miles an hour, no more beast. It's more like a Girl Scout. So, not that there's anything wrong with Girl Scouts, but um, a lot calmer. Like, this is the bike's weakest point, is when you're going fast. Over 110, somewhere around there. So, I found, once I took the Rottweiler off and put the stock airbox back on, I know, crazy stock airbox back on, and then just a race filter. Just take out the OEM filter and buy a race filter. There's, there's lots of different companies that make them. Pretty thin metal rail slides in, and that's how I race the bike in the most successful manner, in the best setup, the fastest lap times, the, the, the most competitive on the track, track days, track racing, was with the stock airbox. And I didn't just buy and leave it stock, I bought it, modified it, and then went back to stock. So take it for what it's worth. You're paying nothing for this advice and that's about what it's worth. That's what I did and it worked for me. Next. Rotors, pads, okay. Okay, next great tip that I have such good, I can't even say luck. I don't feel like it's good luck. I just feel like it's really great performance that's reliable is the brakes. Everybody says, you know, what, what master do you use? I've used the stock master, the, the, the Gen 1, the Gen 2, the Gen 3, the stock brake master. I'm like, how did you disconnect the ABS? I didn't disconnect the ABS. I still use the ABS. I love the ABS. You're going to tell me you have a computer that's like modulating the wheel speed a thousand times a second or something that's like saying, hey, go, go. You want some help with braking as you leaned over, trailing into a turn? You want us to try to help you not lose the front end? And I'm gonna say, no, are you crazy? Please help, give me all the help you can have. And I feel like for me, it's a boost to my confidence. I feel more confident on the braking with ABS. Um, so I use the stock master. I keep the ABS on, um, what is it, supermoto mode? Um, track mode, supermoto, whatever. Um, but what I do change is the pads. I use the Vestra SRJ, whatever the hell they are, XX pads, and they're exceptional. I'm telling you, when I go head to head, usually it's with bikes that are more powerful and more suited to the racetrack and guys with lots of experience and, and I'll pass them on the brakes. I, I, I will pass them on the brakes and it happens all the time. People come back to me and say like, holy, shit, dude, what is it with the brakes on that bike? And I think it's the bars being 
the position they are and, and you have just a natural control. I think it's the width of the bars. So when you're when you start to lose control, like when you're when you're leaning in and the front starts to tuck a little bit, you get this much warning as the front starts to tuck. Whereas clip-ons and things, you know, maybe you're getting less warning. So it's just the way I explain it, but that's the way I feel. Very good confidence, very good confidence with the brakes, and the Vestras bite like a son of a bitch. Um, but there is a downside. I found that sometimes the material from the pads can build up on the stock rotors, on any real rotors, really. And sometimes if you don't really do maintenance like you should, like if you're racing a bike, people say you should change the brake fluid like every round. I change it every season, but um, you know, you're just supposed to maintain it um, because it gets hot and it gets degraded in quality and it loses its ability to, to absorb heat and things. So, but with the brake pads, when, that, when the material builds up on the rotors, You'll find at the end of a weekend or the end of the second weekend that you put it up on the front stand and you, you can't spin the wheel so much. It, you know, stop like this. And you spin it again, it stops like this. That is the material from the pads building up on the rotors so much that you've got brake material against brake material and there's a lot of dragging. So there's two things that I do to combat that and they're both equally effective. One, is I don't use stock rotors anymore. I use um, brake tech, full floating. So, and you know, see these buttons? Like these are supposedly floating rotors, these little buttons. So, I mean, you can hear them click. You can hear those clips. Um, theoretically, they move. So you have the two pads and the rotor's gonna find the path of least resistance. Theoretically, I don't think so. So a full floating rotor, a real full floating rotor, when you push the bike, you can hear ting, cha ting, cha ting, cha ting. It's like Christmas time. Here comes Santa Claus, especially when you go backwards for some reason. So when you have those full floating rotors, which I have, they're, they're beautiful. They can make end of the weekend, end of the second weekend, end of the third weekend, you can still spin the front wheel and it just, which is beautiful. But even they can get a buildup after a while. So this is a trick that I do that's not really that tricky. I take before any track day or before any race, simple green. And I only do the bottom of the bike. I'll spray the wheels, spray the brakes, the rotors, under the motor, under the swing arm, the rear, and then take a power washer and I just power wash it off. Get all the simple green off that you put on the bike because it corrodes aluminum surfaces and things if you leave it on there. Power wash it off, and I even shoot into the into the, the the calipers, which some people might say, "Oh my God, you do that!" Like, yeah, I do that. And guess what? If I push my bike like this, I think it would just roll 50 yards. It, there's no resistance, and I can come in at the end of a day, all day long riding. It's a breeze to push the bike, so that's a beautiful thing. Okay, uh, here's another tip. Here's another little funky thing. And this, I can't take credit for it. This was not my idea. But um, when you're riding, even on the street, I would do this to a street bike, believe me. I think it's brilliant. And again, it's not my idea. You ever get a tank slapper? Holy crap, right? So look at these bars, look how far they turn. All the way here, all the way here. And um, things flex. You may think like, oh, look how close it comes to the tank. It's not that bad, It'll, it won't hit the tank. Yeah, well, when things flex, it'll hit the tank. The bars will hit the tank, and your tank slappers are intense. And if you crash, when you crash, um, with your bars moving that far, what stops them is those little steering stops, the little bolts with the nuts, and you set it to the right distance, and that's what stops the bar. When you, when you crash and the pavement hits this bar, and it turns that, that hard, that's what, that's what stops. And they always break, especially if you have the KTM, you know, the, the billet triples, which are really cool looking, but they're the same exact, you know, dimensions, the same offset, it's the same. It just looks cooler. Um, maybe they're more rigid, I doubt it, but um, 
you can crash and destroy your triple clamps because, and, and this is where they're gonna get destroyed. Where those bolts are, where those bolts are, which limit the, the travel, they'll just get, the purchase just get ripped off. I'll send you a picture, because I have, it happened to mine. So to combat two things, how far this can turn when you have a tank slapper, which is too far, right? Um, and to kind of save your triple clamps, look at this. I found these on Amazon. I don't know what they're to. They're just a rubber block. So I take these rubber blocks, and Denny, can I get close to you with this? So I take these rubber blocks. Is this, is this, you can see this? Yep. So I take these rubber blocks, and I just kind of sand away a little angle, and sand away a little angle, all the way down. So I'm kind of opening up that, that valley right there. And then take this, turn the bars like this, and I just, with um, shoe glue or, or Gorilla Glue, you know, that, that rubberized stuff, you can buy it at Home Depot. I just take a drill, drill a hole here, drill a hole here, and put a zip tie around and put it right there, right on this frame, right there, like that. And zip tie it and, and glue in that channel. You know, you gotta move the wires a little bit. Oh, sorry. Um, and it perches right there. And this way, when you get into a tank slapper or when you crash, you're hitting that pad. You're hitting this rubber block instead of those steering stops, which will destroy your forks. And also, when it goes to all the way those things, your bars are gonna crush your tank. Whether it's a Gen 1, 2, or 3, your bars are gonna crush your tank. Big dent, big dent, this block will avoid that. The limitation is the bars won't turn as much for when you're like in your garage trying to get around the washing machine and the spare car. That's the only time it's gonna really affect you. But you're never gonna to need to turn the bars that much on the street, you know, unless you see a hot girl, oh my God, you turn. But you can work it out, it's, 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 it's worth it. So these things are fantastic and I will leave a link in the description where I got them off Amazon, like $7 or something. They're fantastic. Just make a little, little valley, shoe goo, which is great glue, by the way. Amazing. GP, the last thing of all these things that we did to the Gen 2 to make it unbelievable is uh, the GP cartridges. Um, GP suspension makes cartridges for the forks. I think they're like 1200 bucks. Um, and right now you have like basically no adjustability. There are little knobs here, theoretical knobs, but I think it's more like the set of Star Trek, you know, when they sit in those chairs and there's all these buttons and lights all over the place, but none of them do anything. That's kind of like these controls because they are, they look like controls, but they don't do a goddamn thing. Not that you can feel. So you get GP cartridges, because um, you're doing track days, you're on the track, you're gonna race, you want control. You want to be able to adjust things like compression, how quick your front comes up when you hit a bump, and rebound, how quick it goes back to a suspension. And I'll tell you one very, very quick story that will help you understand why cartridges are good to have over stock forks. And, and this is a little bit of uh, revealing. When I was the first time running the, the Gen 3 Super Duke, um, I had the new Gen 3 cartridges from GP Suspension. And interestingly enough, the guy who was helping them develop them, we weren't really done, right? They just gave me what they thought would work and go ahead, try them out and let's see what happens. Um, so I, first few laps going faster and faster, and there's a turn where you brake pretty hard, so the front comes down, and then you're trailing in, and let go of the brake, and, and you crest this hill, and you go into this really cool kink of a turn. And what happened was, I broke, the front end came down, fine, it held the weight up fine, and as I trailed and let go of the brakes to tip in, the bike whoop, came up. The rebound was 
there was no control with the rebound and it just it just came right back up and when it came up i lost my ability to turn like we talked about before, when you crack the throttle and you, all of a sudden your turn widens, well, now I'm trailing going in and I have a nice line and there's the apex and I let go of the brake and whoop, now my apex is over here, right off the track. Into the desert, it's always desert around here. And wild ride, took me like a quarter of a mile to get back to the racetrack. And thankfully there's no walls. Um, but, but that's a really, really interesting thing about riding a motorcycle is trailing, braking and trailing and, and as you tip in, you let go of the brake because you get that energy down on the front end and you want to keep it down and replace what holds it down from the braking to the G-forces of the turn. So it's kind of like that. As you tip in, you let go of the brake and you get that synchronized perfectly and it's, and it's a nice transition. You lower the front and you keep the front low through the turn. So not having cartridges, not having that control of not just the compression, but the rebound, I let go and whoop, lost it. So back they went to GP suspension, they made adjustments, I wrote another one, made a couple more adjustments, and now they're dialed. But that's how critical it is. One goes off the track, and one does the best lap time you ever did. Fantastic. So, whew, that's a lot of stuff. I want to say, in closing, that I give you all credit for riding a bike that not, not everybody rides. As a matter of fact, some of your friends might say, what the hell are you riding that thing for? But it's so satisfying when you pass those same friends on their ZX-10 and you're going around the outside of them in a turn. And maybe even your bike is so stable and, and turning so well that you take your hand off and say, you know, hey, how you doing? You just, just say, you know, but you just say, you know, good luck next time. But it, it's, it's, it's a fantastic thing, and I give you credit for going left when everybody else goes right. You're a leader, not a follower.